The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so that, that's a good start to Battle Code Lecture 2. Uh, welcome. Today we'll be talking about how to write your first player, and then at 6 p.m. we're going to be having some Indian food. I'm pretty excited. And it looks like there will be enough Indian food for all of you. I correctly estimated how many of you would show up today. Isn't that a curious aspect of statistics? That you cannot tell what one person is going to do tomorrow, but you can tell very accurately what everyone in aggregate is going to do tomorrow. Quite interesting. I believe in 2006, the number of automobile accident deaths was correctly estimated to the last man, or something absolutely crazy like that, because it's a number like 40,000. And it was, est it was unbelievable. So let, with, that, with that heartwarming opener uh, about <laughs> automobile uh, uh, homicide, I'm going to play some slightly less, um, some slightly more calming images. So you see here on the screen is the evolution of a very simple rule. Uh, this, this rule is something like sum up the number of nearest neighbors. And if that number is even, then the square will be white in the next turn. And if the number is odd, then the square will be black. It's something like that, uh, in, in essence. And it ends up making this repeating pattern that is quite mem mesmerizing to see and is an excellent example of emergent complexity. So what we'll be doing today is we're going to write code that's pretty darn simple. A rule like you know mod 2 equals 0, something like that. And what we're going to get is some really awesome looking behavior that comes out of that very simple rule. So there you go. That's my tie-in for that. Um, administration stuff. So here I've brought up the Battle Code website. Um, you should all be set up with Eclipse right now already. If you haven't, then you're falling behind. But then again, at the same time, you save yourself some effort because we've just put out another, re another release. So uh, what you want to do is download the installer and install it to the same directory where you currently have battle code. And that should update everything without deleting the progress that you've made on your player. Um, so there's that. There's also some exciting things I'm supposed to be announcing that, um, that we'll, be we'll be giving away prizes for things other than winning. So if you're, if you're already, if you're going to see my amazing code and you're going to go, man, I didn't think I could do that well, although I, I find it much more likely that you could watch what I'm going to do and then go, I could have done that in my sleep. I can't believe this guy. Uh, but what, uh, yeah, we'll be giving away prizes for doing things other than winning this year. And those things, I'll be announcing throughout the year so that you can like keep them in the back of your mind and be like, oh, I, I sort of have code that kind of does that. I should, I should think about doing this. Uh, there will be beating the reference player with the fewest total byte codes, uh, beating the reference player in the shortest possible time. By the way, we haven't released the reference player. We will be uh, releasing one within the next couple of weeks. And uh, I don't know if I've said it yet, but to get credit for the course, you have to beat the reference player that we that will provide on a map set that we provide. So it'll be called reference player, and you'll and there'll be more information about that later. Um, you're also able to get credit by writing a short report on how your code works if you weren't able to beat the reference player. So don't don't fret too much. So those two ways are ways of winning money. You can also have the most interesting use of our source code, like if you want to like. Make it so that Nyan cats are part of battle code or some other silly thing. That, that might get you something. And there's also most impressive non-winning strategy, which may very well be the thing that we see today. All right. Uh, so here I'm going to go to Eclipse. This is our supported development environment. And I'm going to start setting up a new player. So this is I've got all these extra battle code installs because of the development uh, nonsense that went on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just start from scratch 
And I'm going to make sure that I talk about the functions that I'm using um, in ways that are useful to both beginners and intermediate people. So beginners have to like hurry to catch up, and intermediate people are more hearing about the Battlecode API and hearing about like how things are put together, uh, specifically about Battlecode that they wouldn't already know from their Java experience, for example. So let's let's start this way. I want to make a new team that I can that I can fight against my other teams that are here because I want to keep trying this. You know. A big thing about programming is making it iteratable. Uh, iterable? Iterable. Iterable implements runnable. Anyway, these kinds of things. Um, and so you'll want to have like a bunch of different robots that can play against one another. And so you can be like, all right, I'm going to right click this Teams folder, and I'm going to go to Create Package, and I'm going to call it, uh, what's a good name for this awesome robot that we're going to make? Yeah, awesome robot. OK, play, awesome robot player. I, I guess that's, that's decent. Um, yeah. And then in this one, I go new file, and I call it robotplayer.java. It has to be called that, because that's the thing that our game engine is looking for. So then at the very top, we're going to write down uh, package awesome robot player, and, uh, and then we're going to put a semicolon. Yeah, because you've got to do that. Um, then we'll import. Everything in Battlecode, so that we can use the Battlecode um, the Battlecode API, which is here in Battlecode.common uh, .star. So that'll give us everything that's in the Java docs. So what I'll sort of want to do is have open the Java docs, maybe in one window or on the side, and have open this in another window, so that I can sort of bounce back between them. I'm not going to do that at the moment because that would make things even harder to see. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to increase the text size, because I know some of you at the back are not going to be able to see 100% of what I'm doing. If you want to follow along on your laptops, go ahead. I believe, I'll, I believe we'll be able to post this code uh, after lectures. So don't worry too much about like, making sure that you can type as slowly as I can. Awesome. Is that too big? It might be. Here we're, gonna, we're, just gonna, we're just gonna run straight in. So public class robot player. You got to write that. So now, OK, so you've written that. Uh, the Java IDE, you, can no you notice, we'll put these uh, brackets in for us real nice. Uh, and you need a, a run method. Pub public static void run. And that's going to take the argument robot controller, um, and then you can name it whatever you want. I, I generally call it my RC. So this robot controller object is the thing that is a robot. So when you run this code, Every robot has its, is its own myRC. And so the methods of myRC, which you'll see later, will apply to that particular robot. You'll see some examples. So what I like to do is I like to, make, I like to define the variable um, the, for, for this robot controller object. I like to define a variable so it can be used throughout this class, the, throughout this package. So I'm going to type private static robot controller RC. And RC is going to be the thing that I define to my RC. I'm just going to say, there you are. Now you've got it. And I can use all of the methods in robot controller by typing RC dot. And then, bingo, right there, uh, you see Eclipse is telling me all of the methods that are in the battlecode.common directory, you know, that, that are all these methods that you can use. So right here, it's like, oh, this is a really convenient way of doing things. Uh, and so you're going to see you're going to see that throughout today's lecture. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that I've got everything organized in a way that I can use it. Because I'm sure everybody here has written code in some language or other that just goes on and on and on, and it's and it's like absolutely massive. And so every time you want to make a change down here and up here and down here and up here and up here and, up, and then you just sort of get a headache and you have to fall over and it's not, it's not very good because you could be at, a, at an elevation and falling over at elevation is, is highly damaging. Um, so what we want is this method will run. But if we only run it like this, let's see what happens. Can, can any of you guess what's going to happen if we run Awesome Robot Player? That's right. It's going to die. Can you tell me why it's going to die? Because run will reach the end of a method. That's right. That's right. Because run will reach the end of a method. So both of the teams explode. 
I'm kind of curious which team won that match. Let's see here. It says um, they both died. Ah, team A won. Good thing to know. Team A will win if both teams die. So let's, let's make a while true. Yeah, yeah, all right. The game's unbalanced. I recognize that. We'll, we'll patch it in, uh, I don't know, in two seconds or 10 minutes or whatever. Um, we're up to, did I mention that we're up to 1.1.0? So definitely go and install that. 1.1.1? That's so fast. Our development cycle is amazing. <laughs> So while true, we'll just keep looping. And so let's try this. Let's do while true. What's going to happen? Can anybody tell me what's going to happen when I do while true? That, something that's undesirable. Um, these guys are going to use 10,000 bytecodes because they just keep looping. While true, while true, while true, while true. And I guess this one comparison, this like going to the end of the loop and coming to the top, I guess costs some non-zero amount. So, they end up reaching their bytecode limit. That's no good. So if we do rc.yield, that ends the turn. So whatever happens here above rc.yield will happen, and then it'll go to the next round. So now the bytecode usage for each robot, you'll see, and, and right now all we've got are these headquarters robots, the bytecodes used is three. Uh, I'll just have to read it out because it's so small you can't see. Yeah, um, yeah, it's three. So that's, that's fantastic. That's like the minimum that you can get. All right, so now we're going to put real stuff in. We want the headquarters to behave differently from the robots. For example, because the headquarters can never move. You know, it, it can't walk around. So let's use if rc dot. Now, what we want is we want to figure out like what type of robot it is. So let's look at the, at the different options here. Oh, look, there is an rc dot get type. Yeah, all right. So now we can just say if that equals robot type dot soldier, that's not what I wanted. Sold, yeah, if it's a soldier, then we can like put soldier code here. And otherwise, we can put like headquarters code here. So let's make a very simple, uh, a very simple thing. Like let's say we want to just kill the enemy. Kill them, kill them dead. Um, so let's have, let's have us do this. We will define a new variable right here now in this space. Direction dir equals rc.getlocation dot direction two. And now we'll just like we want to go straight to the enemy. We wanna we wanna make we wanna find the direction to the enemy and then we we wanna go that direction. So it's telling me there's an error because the direction two needs a direction to what? So let's give it a location. We're gonna give it the location rc.sense enemy hq location. So there you go. Now we're we're all, we've already got the direction. I'm gonna put a semicolon at the end of the line. And now I can see, all right, I'm going to try to go that direction. To move in a direction, you've got to be active. Because there are certain things you can do, like laying mines and diffusing them, that make you inactive. So I'm going to, I'm going to check if I'm active. If uh, RC dot is active, which returns a Boolean true if I'm active, well, then let's go ahead and try to move. Uh, and we'll see what happens uh, when we try this. RC dot move in direction dir. And so now we're, gonna, we're just going to see. We're going to see what happens. Oh, what's this? It's telling me that an unhandled exception is here. Move can throw exceptions. And so what we do is we put in add throws declaration. So then up here, robot controller uh, is going to throw an error if this thing has a problem. And this is, this is a way that you can use. This is Java's built-in form of debugging. And you're going to find it very useful because when you have a problem, it'll tell you what the problem is. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, Hmm. Well, the problem is we don't have any soldiers. We can't produce any units, so you know, there's nobody who can run this code. So let's go ahead and add in some unit spawning abilities right over here. So I'm going to go to example funks player, open up robot, robotplayer.java, and I'm going to copy this part, which is for if the robot is a headquarters. And I'm just going to go ahead and paste it right in there. And now, all of a sudden, I'm spawning units uh, at random directions around myself as the headquarters. So now we should have units in our awesome robot player, and they start to run at one another. Oh, but something strange is happening. When they run into one another, it seems like they are immediately colliding and exploding. Boom. That one exploded, and then that one exploded, and that one did. Oh, that's sort of weird looking, isn't it? It almost looks like this guy is changing color. But no, they're, they're running into each other and exploding. And the problem, it's not just that they're going too fast, because that isn't the thing. It's that there's a game action exception. And you can see here that 
like there's tons of exceptions, and they all showed up here. And I can be like, OK, I don't understand anything at all. I, I can't read any of this language. Uh, um, oh, but look, it says robotplayer.java colon 15. I can just click there, and it shows me what, what's throwing the exception. Oh, it's this line. Oh, I see. I see. It's having trouble moving there, because maybe there's something in the way. So let's also stipulate that RC dot can move in the direction. This is another method that's provided to you that lets you check whether the direction is movable. So now, when we run the code, they're going to just go to the middle, kiss, and kill each other nice and slow, just like that. Wow. Oh, that's beautiful. And I think that's just going to happen all day long until the end of, see, uh, when you get past a certain number of rounds, the headquarters begin to take end of round damage. So you can see the headquarters are just going to die. Uh, and that happens, and they both die at once. And I believe player A will have won. Uh, oh no, player B won. <laughs> now, let me tell you, that's balance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we know what we're doing. And that's, all right, this is getting sort of, this is starting to get kind of cluttered, right? This is, I, I'm not happy with this. I, I'm not a neat freak. Um, my wife kind of is. No, uh, I, sh I shouldn't say anything about my wife on this because it's going to be recorded. No, she's not a neat freak. She's a very wonderful woman. The, OK, so. God, I'm, I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> all right, all right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a new method that will clean the place up. We'll call it public static void. Um, we'll call it, we'll call it uh, HQ code. This is the headquarters code. And it's the stuff that I want the headquarters to do. And I'm just going to copy this in here. And then I'm going to put HQ code there. Bing. So now I'm calling this method, which I've defined below. And that'll just, that'll just sort of like insert that code right, right in there. Really convenient. Now, can anybody tell me why there's a red underline under spawn? Game action. Yeah, a game action exception. So what'll happen is I'll just click on this button. And now this code will have this guy will throw the exception. So exceptions from here will throw up, and they'll throw to here, and then they'll throw even more. Now, let's say. Let's say that we don't want to throw them all the way up to the top, because you don't want run to ever throw an exception, because it causes your robot to explode. So how do you, how do you prevent thrown things from getting out? Like, like if, if, uh, if Billy throws me a football, how do I keep the football from hitting my house, which is behind me? That's right, I catch it. OK, and in Java, the way that that's done, I know a lot of you know this already, but some of you don't, and you're going to think that was a really clever analogy is you put try on the outside, all right? And then you put, um, I think I put it, I, don't, I think I want to put it here. I want to put catch here. Yeah. And so specifically, I want to make sure that I catch the exception. So I'll go, I'll catch exception E, which will be whatever exception comes out of try will go into E. Now, you see that the tabbing is messed up, because try should have a tab after it. So I just highlight this, and I do control I, and that, that automatically tabs it out. 95% of you knew that already, but the 1%, the 5%, I can, I can add. The 5% that didn't know are like, oh, that saved me so much time. I'm so happy. Yeah, so we, we're going to catch the exception, and then we're going to do system.out.println, and we're just going to say, like, you know, caught exception before it killed us. Yeah, and we're going to just print it. So we're going to go e.print stack trace. And we'll pick the third one, because it looks good. Yeah. So now when there's an error, it'll just print down to here rather than killing the robot. Um, at the same time, I should mention that any time a try finds an error and moves to catch, you get 500 bytecode penalty right there. So that's like not a great way to write code. You want to avoid, avoid having the exceptions at all. All right. All right. But we're getting sort of stuck, because we haven't had as much killing as we really wanted to have. So I've got an idea for how to make code that kills other, uh, that that kills the enemy. Um, so let's let's go with that idea that I have. That I definitely have, and I'm not coming up with on the spot. Um, so that let's that was a joke. I, I actually am not coming up with it on the spot. I'm so offended that you didn't find that it was a joke. I just have to find out where it is in the notes. It's in um, it's in. Um, 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 Capture encampments. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's let's not capture an encampment yet, because that's not as exciting as. Because uh, you know what we would really like to do is just you know defeat the enemy, and then we'll, we'll worry about like sort of um, 
um, shaming them into an, a greater defeat subsequently. So let's see here. Uh, if you're a soldier, maybe the right thing to do is sort of start by massing up your troops in a place. So let's get a place to mass up the troops. Now maybe you only want to do this once. Like a, it's sort of like a rally point for everybody. So let's, let's get this rally point. I'm going to make it here because I want everybody to know where this, ra this rally point is. So a rally point is a map location because you want everybody to sort of localize around a place. Now a map location is yet another object like, like robot controller and it has its own methods uh, and, and you know, uh, properties associated with it that you can find in the Java docs and that you can call uh, and that you can find your own way. So let's do this, map location, um, rally point. Yeah, we're just going to rally somewhere. This is a real. This is going to be a good strategy. Trust me. It's going to be. You're going to be excited. Uh, so let's do. Let's find the rally point. Start out. So let's let's make a function because it's already getting you know far too uh, far too uh, fluffy. I think. So let's find the rally point here. We'll say rally point equals find rally point. Yeah. Now where where should we rally? I think a decent place. Oh look at this. It's even going to help me out here. It noticed that there's no method, so I can just click here. And it'll make me a nice method. Look at that. It's just like this HQ code with the private static, and then it has the type that it returns. See, this time it, we're making a function that returns a type. This didn't return anything. It just, it just, made, it just did code here. But now we want it to like spit out an answer. So we're going to have it return a map location when it's done. So what we'll do is we're going to get some location between us and the enemy. Seems like a great place to rally our troops. So between us and the enemy. Let's see, the enemy location, so I'm just going to make this nice and simple. Map location, enemy lock. I, you can define variables anywhere. This will be local to this function. The enemy location is rc dot, uh, uh, sense enemy. Yeah, there. Sense enemy, OK, map location. Our location is rc dot sense hq location. Yeah. And now I want to find sort of the average. I'm not going to do it in the smartest possible way. I'm going to do it in a way that's easy to understand, is I'm going to say, um, there's an integer x, which is enemy location dot x plus our location dot x. All right. Now, I guess I, if you took the average of the two, that would be in between, right? That would be in, be, in between the, the, the two. But we don't want it completely in between the two because we want to sort of just you know, move a little bit out. So let's make it more of our lock and less of theirs. So three of ours. And now we put a multiply. And that should get us one quarter of the way to the enemy, because it's mostly us and somewhat them. Yeah, we'll do that for y as well. There's probably smarter ways of doing it than just writing out two lines, but it's, very, it's pretty clear. And now what we'll do is we'll use the constructor for map location. So we'll say map location rally point it equals new map location, and we give it an x and a y. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Now we can just say return rally point. OK, so now we're going to try to go to the rally point. Rally point has been defined here. That's useful. So now later, we don't have to give it a direction. We can just say direction deer equals get location dot direction two. Now we'll go to the rally point instead. Yes, yes, to the rally point. Rally point. Let's see if our robots are going to the rally point. I recommend that you try running your code every time you make a significant change. And look, they did. They went to the rally point. But yeah, they kind of went there in a dumb way. Because when one of them was in front of the other, they couldn't go around. They, they need some, because now this guy can't spawn any more robots. I'm pretty sure he's trying, but it's not working. In fact, what, what error am I getting here? I'm getting you cannot move in the direction none or omni. That's an interesting problem. That's the problem that. When a robot is on top of the spot, he shouldn't try to move to the spot that he's on top of. So we should also specify that there's a distance. And he should only try moving if there's a distance. So let's just put int dist equals rc.getLocation. Do you always do that too? I always put i before o. Dot distance squared 2. And distance squared to rally point. Yes. That's a, that's a useful method. There are a lot of useful methods for get location. And you might say, all right, how was I supposed to know that distance squared 2 was a method from get location? I was going to write my own manual function that goes looking for x's and y's and squaring them and subtracting them and so on. Uh, not that subtraction is really even relevant here. But how was I supposed to know? Well, I'll tell you how you were supposed to know. 
You just go to the, you just go to where you installed it. I put it in uh, Battle Code 2013. You go to Doc, and you go to the, to this thing, all classes frame, and this shows you all the classes. And one of those classes here is map location, and under map location, you see that you can add map locations to directions. You can add them to x's and y's. You can use direction two, distance squared. You can check whether two map locations are equal to one another. If they're adjacent to one another, that's pretty useful. So you know, having a sort of a working understanding or sort of memorization of these things will help you along the way. So let's, now we've got distance squared too. So now we only want to move toward the enemy if, so if our distance is greater than zero, then we'll try moving there. Otherwise, let's not, because it's just going to end up giving us trouble. And I'm, once again, I'm going to do Control I to do this indenting. Ah, but this is getting somewhat cluttered, so why don't I just make this soldier code, especially here when, when everything is a giant font 16. So this is soldier code, and I'll just go ahead and have it automatically create me that method. I'm going to go ahead and put this in the method. And now rc.move has got a throw declaration. You see this? I, 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 pretty soon, I'm not even going to need to be here because it's doing everything for me. My goodness. So now they should go to the rally point, and they shouldn't be throwing quite as many exceptions as they were before. Oh, look at that. In the uh, game output window, you see no exceptions from round 0 to 5,000. Excellent. But again, they're just sort of stuck behind one another. How can we make it so that they're not stuck? Well, here's a good way to do it. So here, you're only trying one direction. But now, let's make a, a, a way to try multiple directions. The way that I'm about to show you uh, has its own emergent complexity built in. You're going to like this a lot, uh, I believe. So yes, let's do it. Let's define a list. Now, lists are defined this way. You put an open square bracket. And I'm going to make a list of integers, because I'm going to try, I'm also going to use some tricks for direction. Because a lot of you were probably thinking, oh gosh, I noticed in the Java docs that Direction, you know, here I'm going to go to Java Docs again. Direction is here. And there's all, there's all these directions, east, north, northeast, blah. There are eight directions. I can rotate them left and right, but oh, am I really going to enjoy rotating them again and again to find you know, wh which direction I'm going to? Like, I, OK, I could go forward. If forward is blocked, then rotate the direction left. If the left is blocked, then rotate it. No, that, that would be actually really annoying to write. And, uh, and it's not the most elegant way to do it. The way we're going to do it is we're going to get the direction values, and then we're going to use the direction list. So the direction list consists of these eight things. I believe it starts at north, and then it goes around to northwest. And so direction list at 0 is north. And so I'm going to show you how we're going to do that and what amazing result it has. Because a lot of you already know how to code, but you don't know what amazing result this is going to have. Or maybe you do. So this integer I'm going to call the uh, uh, direction offsets. And you can define an integer list by setting it equal to this construct. So I'm just going to put uh, uh, curly brackets. And now I'm going to do 0, 1, minus 1, 2, minus 2. Yes. So that now gets me some direction offsets. And I need to start checking directions. So I'll use for direction, I'll use for integer d among the list direction offsets. So now this for loop will loop again and again, and it'll put one of these integers in each time it runs. So the first time it, run, it runs, d will be 0. The second time, d will be 1, and so on. So this is for d in direction offset. And there needs to be an S. And what I'll check is if I can move in that direction. So let's go ahead and check that. Oh, by the way, let's simplify matters a little. Because we've got is active here, but there's no reason to look at directions if you're not active. So let's go ahead and put this is active up here. Oh, gosh, the guys of you who are following on your laptops must be just like frantic at this point. Uh, yes, because, because you know, it's, it's like that. It's very emotional, very personal. So then what we'll do is we'll check if you can move. If you can move, oh, but wait, this isn't right. What direction is now important? Direction looking at currently. You can name these whatever you want. Uh, the, the direction you're currently looking at is the following. First, you want to look at direction. Uh, and so we'll see deer up here is the direction to the rally point. So we'll look at direction. We'll say, OK, what is, oh, let's see here, uh, uh, ordinal. Ordinal gives me which number this is in the list of eight directions. So if I'm currently looking at north, 
If I, that is to say, if the direction of the rally point is north, then dir.ordinal retu will return 0, because the list of directions starts with north. And in Java, the uh, index of a list starts at 0. So the first element is at 0. So dir.ordinal gets me 0. I'll add, uh, and then I'll add the direction offset number. And now I will index into directions again. So I'll say directions direction.values is a list of directions. And the part of that that I take, indicated by these square brackets, will be dir.ordinal plus d. I'll add 8 to make sure that it's not negative. And then I'll do mod 8. The percent 8 is a mod 8. And you're going to find uh, this may be alien to, to you to begin with, but you'll find that this kind of construction uh, helps you out immensely. So now you're looking at a direction currently. If you can move in that direction, what you want to do is leave this loop. You don't want to stay in the loop anymore. Uh, uh, it's giving me this. Uh, in, oh, yes, uh, semicolon? No, that's not right. Uh, oh, right, right, if I can move. I forgot to put if I can move. Yeah, thank you for catching that, um, me. Yes. <laughs> if I can move the direction I'm currently looking at, I want to leave this loop. So uh, I'm throwing a lot at you, but, uh, but here you go. We'll name this thing the look around loop. And now we can do break look around. And now that will get us out of this, that will get us out of this piece. Um, yeah. Everybody likes to be splashed in. Nobody, nobody likes the first 27 pages of that intro to C++ book that talks about declaring variables and what the hell private static means. It doesn't matter what private static means. You don't need to know. You don't need to know. <laughs> don't you think? I hate that. I tried to learn languages so many times. Here, I'm thumping the desk. And, and it, anyway, it, oh, oh, I, I have nothing but animosity for their correct ways of doing things. That's why I don't study number theory. My goodness. Yeah, because they prove like, that addition works before they do any addition. I can't imagine how they get anything done under those circumstances. So you can see here that, that, that nothing works at all. <laughs> let's, see, let's see. The robot is spawned, but it never moves. OK, so it can move, but it never actually did move. That's right. So what we need to do is make it move. So within this loop, we've just exited the look around loop. That's this one. So we're just going to put rc.move, please move, please move, at currently, yes. And when this guy moves, he's just good. Did I? Oh, scope. Oh, man, these guys are smart. So you see here that this is, this is inside this block, so it can't be accessed from outside. So what I'll do is I'll define it outside. And I'll just equal, I'll, I'll, I'll pre-initialize it at dir. And then when I use it in here, it'll be accessible to that out there. You, look, look, you think I made a mistake, but it was actually deliberate so that everybody would know about this sort of scope problem that, as you referred to it. Although, to be honest, it, scope to me just means Listerine. All right, so now what they're doing, it's, it's almost, it's hard to see, but they're, they're moving around one another. And they're, they're sort of like oscillating. See that? Look at that, look at that yellow. He's going around. And that's because you know, he's, he's looking at the best direction that he can go in. Yeah, that's pretty cool. What, what is going on here? <laughs> Cannot move in the given direction, west, south, blah, blah, blah. Now, why can't they move in that direction is sort of an interesting question to ask. And it may be because some of them are entirely surrounded by other robots. Like this guy, for example, uh, may, may end up being entirely surrounded by the robots. One of the problems that you will encounter is that every round, Robots move, and they don't remove. They don't move synchronously. So it'll be really instructive if I had the time. I would show you that the number of adjacent robots is not the number that you might expect, because this guy, for example, let's say this guy wants to move to the right. Let's just say he does. He can't move to the right this turn if he executes before this guy. Let's say they both want to move to the right. But if this guy executes first, then he'll move to the right. That'll take place. And then when this guy looks around himself, he's going to see an empty spot there. It can be very confusing for debugging. Um, so that's going to happen. And you might ask, OK, OK, I recognize that nothing can run synchronously, because then two robots can try to move onto the same tile, 
and who, who knows what would happen. It could be like Pauli exclusion principle is violated. Two electrons occupy the same, the same orbital, and, and the, the world comes to an end, a screeching halt, as it were. But so, so here's how we do it. We use the robot ID. Now, this is going to come back later. So don't think that it's just an obscure little thing. This is important. So you can see here that when I click on a robot, it tells me, the ro oh, is this bothering you? I can tell it's bothering half of you. You got like a twitch developing. You're starting to shake. The sweats are coming out. No, sorry, that's me. <laughs> so the robot, uh, you can see here, this is robot 38, the headquarters. Uh, this is robot 115. The lower the robot number, the sooner it executes, because they execute in that order. And I think when a robot dies, its number becomes available, and another one can spawn into that number in case you wanted it. That's all, that's all too nitty gritty. So anyway, there we've got it. Let's start, let's start you know, owning some noobs, as it were. Let's destroy the enemy. It's not going to be as exciting if we're all the same person. So let's, let's, not, let's, uh, let's make sure that we know who we are. Now, one problem here is that this only goes to rally point. Let's put in an argument to soldier code and change the name so that it's more reasonable, so that it's like, go to location. That's kind, of, that's kind of nice. And we'll give it map location, where to go. Yeah. Yeah. Now we'll just put this in here. And now this go to location function can be reused. So first, we'll just go to location rally point. And then after a certain number of turns, maybe then we'll just go to the enemy base. Because we'll have all these sort of clumped up guys. We'll be ready to, ready to own some noobs. So let's, let's do that. Let's go to the enemy base. Let's kill them dead. So let's say here, let's say here, uh, how are we going to figure out what, what round it is? This is sort of an obscure function, clock.getRoundNum. I don't think that there's really, is there anything else under clock that's worth looking at? Clock, get bytecode num. Oh, you can get the number of bytecodes you have left. That's pretty useful. So you could, you could say, oh, is it worth doing this computation? I don't know if I need that many extra digits of pi. So, so here, if, if my clock, which returns an integer, if that clock number is greater than is uh, less than 500, yeah, maybe five. Oh, well, you know, let's just make it 200. We don't we don't have all day. Yeah, we'll make it 200. If it's less than 200, then go to the rally point. If it is more than 200 or equal to 200, let's go to rc dot uh, get uh, sense enemy. Yeah, let's go to the enemy. Let's just go ahead and kill him. So now we've got these two pieces in here. We're going to take our uh, awesome robot player, and we're going to play against Hardbot. Yeah, the bot that's supposed to be hard on my map, Tiny. Yeah. Um, cannot move and get. Well, let's just hope that that's not going to be a problem. OK, so I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. Getting ready for the blitz. It's round, it's round 150. It's round 150. Go. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Kill him, dude. Knocking him out. What bam What bam You know? One thing that's important is you got you to you know, give yourself a little pat on the back from time to time. That's what teammates are for, you know, to pat each other on the back. Um, my brother always used to do that. He'd give me a giant five star, like when you slap someone so hard on the back that it leaves like a handprint. Yeah, but that, that let me know that he cared. That was important. <laughs> I think every younger brother needs that. And if you're the oldest brother in your family, then just hit the guy twice as hard. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, you see here that that worked. I might just go ahead and send myself an email saying, Max, you sly dog. You, you made a, a player that beats the hard bot. I mean, the hard bot's not actually very hard. All right, all right, so we've got that. That was good. That was good. But maybe what we'd rather do is be sort of more hunter-like about it. You know, we'll, we'll be sort of stealthy. It, what I think would be really cool is to go after the closest enemy unit. Now. You'll find in the documentation a lot of ways of getting enemy data. Like you can sense where their encampments are and go after those. Uh, you can sense where your mines are. You can sense where its headquarters are. You can sense where the enemy robots are. Uh, and you'll probably find yourself at some point going through a list and trying to find like the closest enemy or maybe the closest allied unit. So we're going to do an example of that. Uh, and what we're going to use it for is see example this case where like they're trying to build this encampment, and they're shooting at all of our dudes. And our dudes are just sort of like, they're getting hurt. They should, they should just go gang up on that guy. Why aren't they ganging up on him? So let's, let's make a function for ganging up on the enemy. And it'll require that we locate the closest enemy. I mean, we could probably just go to the first one that's in the list. 
So I don't know which one. Which one should we do? In fact, ah, ah, how about this? We could, um, we could make code. Yeah, let's try this. Okay, this is this is interesting. I, I don't I don't always plan, but when I do, I drink. No, never mind. That doesn't work. Uh, so let's let's see if you can copy a package, and then we'll be able to play awesome robot player against awesomer robot player. Yeah, paste. Okay, enter a new name. Oh, that was helpful. I mean, it's not very smart. Awesomerobotplayer.copy? No, it's awesomer. Yeah, look at that, and it even changed it for me. I tell you, I'm going to be out of a job before the end of the week. So what we want to do now in the remaining moments of lecture is we want to find the closest enemy robot. Now, it may be that there, that there are no enemy robots. This is the thing that I was talking about before. Uh, let's do it. Let's do it. OK, try. So here, I'm a soldier. OK, I don't need to do it if I'm headquarters, so let's just do it if I'm a soldier. We'll, we'll say map location of the enemy robot, because after all, all we currently do is go to places. We, we go there, and it's implied that we kill all the things that we find. Yes, so the map location of the closest enemy. Now, let's see here. This is only going to be valid when there are enemies. You've got you to think about this. So let's instead do, let's get all the enemy robots. So this is a robot list, a list of enemy robots. And we'll call it enemy robots, if we like. doesn't matter what we call it. And we'll go rc.sense. Um, now, this is, this, is, this is the hardest thing to remember. This is the hardest ever possible thing to remember. Sense nearby game objects. This is the, it's, it's hard to remember because it's so accurate. Uh, uh, Robot.class. So we want robots. We want them anywhere. This is the range, uh, the squared range that we're interested in picking up enemies. Now note that these, they won't show up unless they are within one of my allied units' sight range. I put in this huge number just because I'm, I'm willing to take those. So there's, uh, I put in like a million, and then I'm going to make sure that they're enemy by doing RC dot get team, so that's my team, and dot opponent is a team method that gets me the opposing team. Now the two teams are team A and team B. So that's, that's literally written out as team dot A. So I could have written like team dot A or team dot B, but then I would have had to check if I was team A or team B. So you're better off doing it this way. So I'm sensing the nearby game objects. Now I need to know if that gave me any game objects. So I don't know how big this list is. If the list has a length, if enemy robots dot length is equal to zero, well then there are no enemy robots. So I should just do the same thing I was doing before. So there you go. Now we've got code that should be working. But if there are robots, now, now what have I done here? I haven't commented a single line of code. OK, enemy, no, no enemies nearby. Yeah, I heard somebody tell a real zinger over there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, uh, so no enemy, OK, enemy, yeah, so someone spotted. OK, enemy is enemy spotted. So yeah, no, that's not right. I put this in the wrong spot. You guys, you guys are not helping me, not helping me nearly as much as I was expecting. So now what I'll do is I'll loop through each of the robots. Now I could do the same looping thing that I did before, where I could say like robot, a robot among enemy robots, and then it would put a robot into each one. But instead, I'm going to do it a different way just to demonstrate it. I'm going to define an integer uh, i equals 0. And then I'm good. And uh, yeah, there you go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I saw you were going to help me, and I really appreciate it. And we'll make sure that I, and, and so what, this is the format for a loop that goes with this, uh, th this type. Some of you are going to be like, that's not the way that the words work that make it explained. <laughs> and I'll tell you that you are right. Um, and and you, get, you get a gold medal um, as soon as we mint them. Enemy, so yeah, enemy robots.length. And we'll do i++. So this will make i will go up by 1 every turn. So now I can type robot, a robot, uh, you know, it, it's an enemy robot, equals uh, enemy robots at i. And now I'm going to look through and find the closest one. Now I'm sure somebody's going to show me a way that I'm doing it wrong. But here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep track of which, was the, which one was closest and how close it was. So int closest dist. And I'm going to initialize it at a large number. And I'm going to do, uh, um, I'm going to make it a location. because I'm And I'll do map location closest enemy. Yeah, closest enemy. OK, so now we'll have 
Now this is very tricky. This little bit of sequ this little bit of sequence is very tricky in the Battle Code API. When I first did Battle Code, they didn't give an example of this, and it took me like 10 years to figure it out. This is how to find out where an enemy is. You type RC, that's like you're starting from you, sense robot info, all right, and then you pass it the robot. So you give sense ro you, you tell it to sense the robot info. Now what does that get you? Does that get you the location? No, that would be too easy. So that gets you a robot info object. If you, so that, now you've got robot info, um, a robot info equals that. So now I've got some robot info. Robot info is yet another one of these classes. So here in the Java docs, I, look at this. I keep opening more and more of them. That's another one. There's another one. They're multiplying. So here you can see robot info. There it was. So you can see that information about the enemy robots can be things like the amount of shields they have, the type of robot, um, its location. One of the robot info things is robot. So what you can do is you can sense the robot. You can you can get the robot, sense its info, and then do info dot robot, and then sense that thing's info, and then you'll have the info. So you can go back to the robot, and it'll be a really nice little loop. It's wonderful. It's just mm, just great. Um, I, I highly recommend that kind of code. It, it's just, it's just, uh, you know, it warms my heart. So, you know, like, does it, does it, what a, like a little kid does? Is that like computationally impressive? No, but it's cute, so it warms you anyway. So that's that was the, that was the reasoning behind that crazy stream of logic. So they, here we go. We got robot info. Let's check the distance and be done with it. So we'll say that the distance, which is an integer, equals a robot info dot location dot distance squared two. Of course, you could write your own distance squared two metric or something or other, but we're just going to do it this way. And we're going to make it the distance from, I guess, it could be myself as the robot. So distance squared two, hmm, hmm, it's sort of hard to decide. It could be the, the one that's closest to me, or uh, let's just do me for the moment. And maybe later we'll, maybe we'll make it more complicated. Actually, we're going to run out of time, and we're just going to end up eating Indian food, but that's wonderful. It's really, how many of you have eaten at India Samrat? That place is fantastic. Wow, oh my goodness, you're in, such, you're in for such a treat. I don't know if it's, gonna, if it's gonna be considered the same level of treat as, oh anyway, I'm just going on and on. It this, so if, if the distance that we're currently looking at is less than the closest dist, then we'll say that it is the new closest dist, and we will assign closest enemy equals, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, it is at, well, I didn't, I didn't record it anywhere. It's this one. Yes. So there it is. That's the closest enemy. So once again, if there were no enemies nearby, we would either go to the rally point or go to location. But now what we want to do, oh, goodness. Hey, quit, quit sending me things on the, anyway. Um, so now what we'll do is we'll just go straight to the enemy. That's what we'll do. If we see one, we'll go kill him. So now what we'll do is we'll pit this code against the previous version of this code, and we'll see which one wins. It's sort of an interesting question. Uh, which code is better, to go straight for the enemy base or to go for the closest enemy robot? Because maybe on their way to the base, I mean, everybody shoots on their way to everywhere, but what's the best thing? I think, I think it'll be quite interesting. So let's see, where do we shoot? Uh, it's here. So now we can go to the location, and we can go to the closest enemy. Yeah, because there's guaranteed to be an enemy. Uh, to go to, oh bother! It's another one of these things. No wait, that's that's there. Go to location closest enemy. Oh right, I got to initialize it. Yeah, so I put null. It'll never see null, but I got to put it there anyway so that it's comforted. I, I believe that's the technical explanation for what's going on <laughs> in the background of Eclipse. Um, I'm pretty sure. So now let's run. Oh man, this is getting exciting. It's 5:55. I guess we'll. We'll, I'll have like some closing remarks, but this will be the thing that like is supposed to be exciting and amazing. We'll have awesome versus awesomer, all right? And ah, oh, but the, these guys, these guys are so—they have a lot of fun. That's so important. I didn't say that again. Um, all right, so raise your hand if you think that awesome robot player, the original one, that, the original awesome, is going to win. Three hands. How many people think that awesomer robot is going to win? Four hands. <laughs> when? OK, well, you know, I recognize that premature arthritis can be caused by coding. Raising an arm may be beyond some of us in terms of like, oh, oh, oh. Uh, OK, we're going to find out. OK, I, I actually don't know the answer. 
Okay, so they're just they're just sort of they're just grouping. It's round 70. It's round eight. It's round 100. At round 200, exciting stuff's going to happen. I wish we could slow this down. It's going to happen all at once. Boom! Oh, oh! But they stopped them. They went. They stopped them. The awesomer player has won. Hooray! Did you see that? It was all too fast. It, was, it, was all, it just went by before. I mean, before I even noticed. It was. It was. Ah, oh, goodness gracious! So here it goes. These, these guys will run back to the base, but these guys will be following them the whole way through. OK, so let's, let's back it up a little bit. This is sort of interesting. Now, I think if you push like F or B or C, you can turn off the circles. Maybe not. OK, so they're short, sort of forming a concave. Um, oh, man, a lot of them are blowing up. It's kind of hard to tell what's going on. OK, so here it looks pretty darn even. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 versus 1. I can't tell if he's dying. <laughs> 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. OK, so it's 10 versus 9. The blue guys have done well, pretty, pretty well already. Oh, but then they just like ping. They just ping and turn around and kill everything. I got I to gotta step forward more slowly. This, this is a fast-paced game, let me tell you. Let me tell you. You're not going to be here for an hour you know, watching somebody. Oh, man. OK, so these guys are all working over there. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Meanwhile, like these guys are ganging up on him. And these three guys are getting totally double teamed or quadruple teamed or whatever the word is by these fellows. Oh, I'm pointing with my finger. How can you see that? I'm, look at me. I'm like, oh, oh, it's over here. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, look, I, look, I'm enjoying myself, OK? Yeah, and then they turn around and they kill the enemy. And then they kill, turn around and they kill the enemy base. So there you have it. Boom. Done. All right. Um, so final closing remarks. Closing remarks. I'm looking at the wrong page. Yeah. So um, improvements to this robot, you know, there's lots of things that you could do that you would do that, that are worth doing. Like, for example, everybody's making decisions independently. You could be using messaging. I think, I think this, is a big, this is a big point. Because a lot. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, what is the point of messaging? Because all of my robots have access to all of my other robots' data. And you saw that happen here. Because would these guys have been able to respond intelligently? Like, like would this guy have come, gosh, I'm using my finger again. Would these fellows be able to come all the way back? I agree, Stephen. I should close Gchat when presenting. Should, would these guys have been able to come all the way back to here if they, couldn't, if they didn't have shared data? No, they wouldn't. So they have shared data. Why would you ever use messaging? Because. You could simplify it by having your headquarters do the processing and say, all right, I want everybody to attack this guy. And then they all just go ahead and follow that command, rather than having to do the processing themselves. Because if everybody has the same data, why should everybody process on the same data? So there you go. That is a reason. It's not, it doesn't prove that it's always better, because it may be much better to have a decentralized approach and so on. There are very many reasons. But there you go. That's an answer to that question. You saw awesome. You saw awesomer. And you saw it right here. Thank you for coming. Um, the next, uh, just you know, uh, remain calm in your seats, and there will be food. The food guy probably arrived already. I'm sorry. Yesterday, I thought the food guy hadn't arrived. Uh, they don't. They don't mind being called food guys. Don't worry. It's not insulting. I, I thought he hadn't arrived, but he, I think he was like poking his head in and out like a drinking bird, and I just didn't see it because of like, you know, various myopia and such. Um, no, what do they call it? Tunnel vision. So yes, the next lecture. I'm sure you enjoyed this one a lot, even if you know Java already. Because you could, you could see the warmth and the smiles on the faces of the people who didn't know Java and now do because of this amazing whirlwind tour. So they, um, yes, the next lecture will be on navigation as if this one wasn't. Yeah. And you're going to hear all kinds of amazing things that you never would have expected. And you're going to see this sort of like awesome visualizer that's a little bit like the fractals that I was showing before. It's made in Mathematica, and it's uh, made in the USA, and um, yeah. <laughs> Hooray. So thank you for coming. And this is the end of lecture. And I'll just be here answering questions. Again, there's lab after lecture. My god, this is like one of those symphonies that you think keeps ending, but it doesn't end. Um, and, that, and that'll be all. Thank you. <laughs>